Dr. Frank Hernandez is a professor at USM and I'm clearly buying myself time as I open up the next presentation. <laughs> um, so Frank's fun fact, I have to tell you, I can't say it without smiling. Frank was once booed off a karaoke stage in a dive bar in Moorhead City, North Carolina. But before you feel too badly for him, he ended up marrying the lead booer. So, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk, mine and the dogs are zooplankton and a subcategory of that called ichthyoplankton. And what you'll see is that zooplankton is really a, a lifestyle, uh, maybe more than a species. And um, ichthyoplankton, I, I think you'll find, um, we we'll talk about those particularly and some of the zooplankton as well. There's some not so underdogs hidden amongst this group. So it's really more of a category of, of a lifestyle than it is any one particular um, a group of organisms. Let's see. So what are zooplankton? Zooplankton are, uh, they're planktonic, they're non-swimming or very weakly swimming organisms. There's over 36,000 species. And so they, they, they cover a wide range of, of taxa, of, of groups, there's vertebrates, there's invertebrates, there are many things in the plankton. So they're not um, broadly defined as, as you, you have to like really think about all the different players in there. And so they, and they don't always respond the same. Many are microscopic. Uh, you can tow a plankton net and look in the bucket when you pour it into the sample out there, and you can see little things swimming around. But to really appreciate um, the diversity and the forms of them, you, you have to put them under a microscope. And they inhabit open water. So they're in the water column. They're not on the bottom. And they're anywhere from inshore bays, coastal areas, all the way out, deep ocean, and, and open seas. <clears throat> there are some organisms, uh, there are some zooplankton that live their whole life as plankton. And these are some examples. Uh, you may be uh, familiar with um, krill. That's one of the major organisms that whales eat, for example, as well as copepods, these small little crustacean-like animals. They really uh, do an important critical function in the ocean. I'll talk about that in a moment. Here's an arrow worm. These are just some of the more dominant things we collect in our samples as we tow um, our plankton nets offshore here. Arrow worms are, are voracious little predators inside this plankton food web. There are other organisms, many, that only spend a portion of their life in the plankton. And so these, if you didn't know, starfish have a larval phase that looks like this. This is an anemone over here. Octopus is probably the most obvious looking one here. Many of these plankton stages, these larval stages, look almost nothing like the adults. And so it's a real challenge when you're trying to ID a lot of these things. But fortunately, there's some good references. But as adults, when these transform, they obviously go to the benthic environment or some other habitat, or they're more mobile and they're not just free-floating in the, in the water anymore. So why should you care? Well, again, these are some of the not-so-underdogs that actually spend a portion of their life as plankton. If you like blue crab, you should know that they have several planktonic stages. And a lot of the population biology of a lot of the things we care about, i.e. eat, um, depends on the survival of these planktonic stages as they're moving through the water column. Oysters, same way. They have, again, multiple planktonic stages. They're in the plankton for a portion of their life, and their survival to the uh, stage where they can settle again on an oyster reef is highly dependent on, on how well that population is going to do. Red snapper, larval fishes uh, inhabit the plankton. Fish eggs also inhabit the plankton. So there's a lot of reasons to care about things other than arrowworms and copepods. In fact, and this is what I do, I'm a fisheries oceanographer, without, with very few exceptions, almost all marine fish have planktonic eggs and planktonic larvae. There are some exceptions, but by and large, anything you go out and catch or try to catch, these are, this is a little dish of larval fishes, many different species. They're going to release their eggs into the water column, those eggs are going to be fertilized in the water column, and the larvae are going to float around for some amount of time before they transform into a juvenile. <clears throat> and really zooplankton, the crustacean types and all these others, and even to the larval fish, they serve this very critical function. And that is zooplankton are sort of the secondary consumer. The phytoplankton takes the energy from the sun, transforms it into new little phytoplankton bodies. And that's where the, the copepods, the other little zooplankton come in. They eat and consume that phytoplankton, and that gets transferred up into the food web. 
So everything else depends on that sort of transfer of energy. Fish feed on zooplankton, larval fishes feed on it, shellfish, birds, whales, it translates up. So zooplankton, you can see all these arrows emanating from it. They form this really critical function in, in our marine food webs. So when asked, you know, were zooplankton impacted by the oil spill? Again, remember, zooplankton is this catch-all term, so there are many different components, and it really depends on how you look at this question. And by that, I mean, as, as researchers, we can look at uh, impacts at different levels. Can we take individuals, a small crab or something, bring it into the lab, treat it with toxicological studies? Almost all tox studies are done in the lab. It's very hard to do anything toxicological um, out in the, in the field. And once we get up to population level and then ecosystem level, you're really now relying on some, some lab stuff, but really you're going out doing field surveys and you're doing modeling. So these are the types of approaches that are used to study these different levels, if you will, of, of organization. And you get different results or you get different perspectives based on what you're studying and the types of studies you're doing. By and large, when you look at the data from uh, the results from different studies, and I'm going to show a whole bunch of stuff that's not mine. I tried to survey many things. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the organism level, and again, these are a lot of these are toxicology studies, and you go and you and they do the results, and generally the answer is yes, there was an impact on these organisms. So I'm going to again scroll through some examples here. These are toxic uh, oil exposures to bluefin tuna, yellowfin tuna, and amberjack larvae. These are the controls. So in this particular paper, these guys were reared in clean water. These are some exposed to oil. And you have this whole suite of abnormalities in their development. You can see here these little eyes that are starting to form. Um, they're poorly, very poorly formed in the oil. One of the main things is this cardiac function. You see this large, clear bubble here. That's, uh, that's a swelling of fluid accumulation of an edema in the bodies of these fishes. Um, there's heart failure, there's circulatory failure, the bodies are curving. There's many sort of developmental impacts that these larvae are, um, that's happening to the larvae as they are exposed to oil. You see this also with red drum larvae, this green section here, this is the area of the brain. So this is a control situation here in clean water. Here's this tiny little brain here, once exposed to oil. You can see this curvature I was talking about here, so abnormal, what, what will be the spine the development there. These are mahi-mahi eggs. This large circle here is the yolk sac. So that's what the larva is going to survive on for the first several days of its life once it hatches. And this is an oil globule, again another energy reserve, in which you can see once exposed to oil is they're already consuming that yolk. So when this individual hatches, it's going to have much less energy reserves as a, a consequence of being exposed to oil. Um, again, lots of other organisms. These are eastern oysters. These are sort of normal development series for their embryos. These are some exposed to oil. There are, again, a suite of uh, impairments. Sometimes they didn't develop shells. Sometimes the shells, little hinges on the shells didn't quite work. There was poor larval growth. And if the oil concentration was high enough, then it induced death in these, these larval stages. Corals also have a pelagic larval stage. This is a planula larva here. And again, these are two species that were um, studied by this group down here. Um, decreased survival of the larvae, decreased settlement as they try to settle down onto a hard substrate and attach. That function didn't work very well. And again, at the highest concentrations, uh, these larvae did not survive um, their toxicology tests. And then uh, one more here, or maybe a couple more. Jellyfish have a, a suite of larval stages. This is a beautiful Ephyra larva, so no oil uh, here. Um, just adding oil, they didn't do so hot, but it didn't kill them, all right? So they were able to survive this oil. This is a mildly stressed situation. But once, in these sub experiments, once you combine the oil with the dispersant at different levels, then you have these very moderate and these very fatal effects here. So in this case, the combination with the dispersant and the oil proved more fatal. And that's a common theme you'll see. Everyone was testing the different variations of the oil and um, this person that was used. And here are the copepods, the little beasts that translate all that uh, energy from the phytoplankton and, and move it up the food chain. They actually ingest the oil. So these little arrows are pointing to oil droplets. You can't see it so well on this side, 
but here they have it under a UV light and you can see the droplets there. Once ingested, it reduced their egg production and it reduced the hatching success of those eggs once they were released. And again, oil plus dispersant ended up being the most toxic. So with copepods then eating oil, and oil was entering in, in the wild. So now, now we're moving out to the wild, now to the ocean in these studies. And now you need baseline data that was, that was um, hammered home in the previous talk, which was great. So we did find several studies that oil carbon, carbon signature from that oil, was found inside the plankton. And so it was getting in through microbial consumption by smaller uh, zooplankton and then being fed on by larger zooplankton. We just saw that the copepods can outright eat oil. A lot of the, um, the carbon from the spill was from methane, you know, so there was gas being broke down as well. So there's different carbon sources from the, uh, the release that were making its way into this planktonic food web. Generally speaking though, when you have the, the baseline data where there was baseline data, and you looked at a population level out there and not in the lab, we don't see a lot of evidence of an impact. And so these are data, this is a paper from um, my lab. We had this time series of plankton samples off Dolphin Island. We looked at the zooplankton assemblage, so the community of zooplankton. Um, we did observe some changes in, in May of June of that uh, year, 2010. That community looked very different than in previous years. However, by July and August, it sort of assumed this pre-spill condition. So the recovery was fairly rapid within weeks, although there was a noticeable change initially. So it seemed very resilient. I had a student look at Spanish mackerel larva. Uh, this is an otolith where we can look at age. We did some gut studies. Spanish mackerel are cool. They start eating other larva at a very small size. So they're little mini predators. We looked at their condition, their growth, all these functions um, from his from samples we had before, during, and after the spill, we really found no differences in their diet, their growth, their abundances. Again, Spanish mackerel seemed fairly resilient to impacts of the oil spill. We did the same exact type of work with red snapper larva. Um, again, the abundances didn't change. We saw just as many out there. However, they did seem to be in slightly poorer condition. So you have that going on. But I'll talk about it again. And it was mentioned earlier, there's so much other noise out there that our evidence suggests that that poor condition was actually related to river discharge and not the oil spill, although there's plenty more room here to research that. This is uh, some other work by another group. These dots are the, um, these are from CMAP plankton station. So they have a nice time series dating back to 1982. And these are the locations where they capture Atlantic bluefin tuna larvae. It was a big concern because the bluefin tuna spawn around the same time um, as, as the oil spill was happening. And so if you look at the footprint of the oil spill during this particular window, when the survey was out, you can see that there's very little overlap, less than 10% of the sort of great habitat where they found these larvae uh, for bluefin tuna was actually impinged upon by the footprint of the spill. So there was some hope there and they found very little evidence that it might've impacted that species. A very similar approach, this is by Jay Rooker and his colleagues. I just pulled two, two parts of a figure here. The top row is Atlanta, excuse me, blackfin tuna. This is blue marlin for June and July. And what you see is the red area are prime habitat for larvae. And then the cooler colors are less desirable habitat for those larvae. Um, blackfin tuna, they sort of have primer, their prime habitat is more inshore. So there was 15 to 19% overlap. That's not true, but it's not 80 or 90%. You know, so it's, it's not great, but it's not horrible. Blue marlin are spawning much further offshore. This is their red sections here. So they were, again, very likely not impacted by the oil spill at all, <clears throat> or at least from the planktonic point of view. So I would say the take on messages from the planktonic perspective is that the results, and, and this can be said maybe for a lot of the research you might see today, really depend on the scale of study. So if we look back at this organism population ecosystem, we know oil affects the individual level, We've seen oil affect the habitats, but you see all these question marks remaining. These dashed lines are indirect effects. So how does, for example, um, the organism, you know, the oil stop fishing, then did fishing, how did that affect the fish that were there, that were there released from fishing pressure? You have all these interactions in this very dynamic system. And so we don't know a lot about all these sort of other side effects of things. It's really hard to detect impacts out in the field versus in a lab. 
and to do so requires baseline data and monitoring. You have to know what the system looks like with all its available noise. I always throw this figure up in a lot of talks. Look at all the stuff that happens in the Gulf. You have hurricanes blowing through. We saw a similar uh, slide previously. You have hypoxia seasonally. You have this giant freshwater discharge event this year. You have hypoxia, all the nutrients coming out of the river. It's not up here. You have invasive lionfish and other invasive species, harmful algal blooms. How do you pick what's the cause of any decline or, or surplus of anything um, out of all this noise? You have to really have very good baseline data and, and choose your questions and hypotheses wisely. The Northern Gulf is highly connected and, and is very resilient. This is a, um, again, here's the footprint of the oil spill. This is just the surface area expression. Um, if you look at the footprint, the size of that footprint versus the surface area of the entire Gulf of Mexico, it's less than 10%. Now, it was very localized for us and it was extremely impactful here, but if you're a copepod and you have a Gulf-wide distribution, for example, 10%, maybe that's not such a bad idea or a bad deal, particularly when you look at this. I mean, the, the Gulf is very connected. We have the loop current, we have eddies coming on. So any copepods, ketic naps, arrowworms, all these zooplankton that may have been impacted, there were going to be currents coming through constantly resupplying these organisms because they're, again, they're just floating with the currents and drifting along. So with the respect of these water column associated zooplankton, um, again, over 36,000 species, there are some that reacted differently than others. If they have a broader distribution, their potential to be resilient was, was much greater. Um, so as a group, they seem resilient. Um, they have high population turnover. They're releasing eggs and having new generations um, daily in some cases, depending on the species. There's transport via these currents. And actually, I didn't show any uh, examples of this, but they're more mobile than we give them credit for, particularly going up and down the water column. They do these massive vertical migrations up and, and down. And so um, they, they seem to be collectively, if you want to call 36,000 species in one, you know, in one sentence, um, somewhat resilient. And I would suggest that they are ideal candidates for monitoring. You see this in, in other parts of the world. They have that low position on the food chain, so they're very responsive to any perturbations that happen in the system. And, um, and, and the other cool thing is I always show students this, we catch a plankton sample, we have hundreds of species in there. We have uh, the, if you have red drum in here, you have their prey and you have their predators all in the same jar. So it's a very good way to sample many, many organisms across phyla and, and life stages um, in, in a single plankton net. And uh, I think that's it for me. So thank you and I'll answer questions later.